matter how minor is going to cause a lot of pain. There's just a lot of nerve endings in the cornea. Um, and this is the uh, kind of a cross-sectional path slide of the cornea. So we'll start at the top with the epithelium. So the epithelium is four to five cell layers thick, uh, composed of stratified squamous epithelial cells. And there are tight junctions between the epithelial cells, uh, which prevent tear, fl uh, film, uh, sorry, the tear, tear fluid from getting into the stroma. And um, the bottom layer of the epithelial cells rests on an epithelial basement membrane. Um, this is not to be confused with an acellular layer called Bowman's layer, which is not labeled here, or sometimes termed Bowman's membrane, which is this kind of avascular light pinkish area right under the epithelium. So Bowman's membrane is not a true membrane, so Bowman's layer is kind of a better way to term it. Um, and it is not the basement membrane of the epithelium. Um, so underneath Bowman's layer is uh, the stroma, which is comprising uh, the bulk of the corneal thickness. Stroma, the stroma is composed of uh, keratocytes, which must be arranged in a specific configuration to allow for transparency um, of the cornea. And another factor that's very important for transparency besides the um, specific arrangement of the keratocytes is actually the amount of hydration um, of, the, of the stroma. So the stroma needs to be at 78% um, water content to maintain its transparency. And it's maintained by not only the tight junctions of, at, at the epithelial layer that I discussed, uh, but also um, barriers at endothelium, as well as a functioning um, endothelial pump, which pumps out um, excess fluid. Um, once you get down to the bottom, you've got uh, decimase membrane and endothelium. Um, and so the endothelium is one mono uh, cell layer thick, and the basement membrane of the endothelium is indeed decimase membrane. Um, so next we're going to talk about layers of the tear film, and there are three layers to this. Uh, so see, kind of starting from the bottom up, um, the bottom layer is the mucin layer, um, which is uh, produced by the goblet cells. And the mucin layer is important because it actually, what, it's what makes the tear film actually stick to the surface, um, kind of the ocular surface. So these mucins kind of stick to microvilli of the epithelial cells. Um, so very important maintaining a good tear film. Um, the bulk of the tear film is composed of the aqueous layer uh, or the water layer. Uh, this is produced by the main lacrimal gland, but also um, there are scattered accessory lacrimal glands of Krauss and Rolfring. Um, the accessory lacrimal glands of Rolfring are in the uh, kind of underneath the palpebra conge, kind of around the margin of the tarsal plate. And the ones of Krauss are in the um, Cornices. So I remember this by Krauss is in the corner, corner with a K, um, so corner of the conjunctiva, which is conjunctival, forn uh, conjunctival fornices. Um, okay, at the very top is the lipid layer, which is produced by meibomian glands. And the lipid layer is important because it prevents or it slows down the evaporation of the tear film. So if you have um, a very poor lipid layer, your tear film is going to evaporate more quickly and also lead to dry eyes. So I'll be, I'll be talking about all this uh, later on in this talk when I talk more about dry eye. Um, so next I'm going to go into some slit lamp um, techniques. This is really basic, um, but we'll kind of go over a few techniques. Probably the two most common techniques that I use probably 99% of the time are going to be diffuse illumination and slit lamp illumination. So with diffuse illumination, you, you're starting at a low mag, kind of a broad beam, uh, low light intensity, and this is just to get an overview to see what's going on. See if there's anything kind of remotely obvious um, that you might want to concentrate on um, later on. Um, and then the slit lamp illumination is when you have the uh, beam at an angle and at a slit, and you can use it to um, examine the anterior segment at all the different layers. Um, some of the other techniques here I use a lot less often. Um, specular reflection is a technique that's used to examine the tissues that are around uh, the normal light reflexes, especially at the posterior corneal surface. Um, so what you do is you have your uh, kind of a very small, intense beam, uh, slit beam at, six, at a 60 degree angle from the viewing arm. Um, and you wanna superimpose the um, posterior corneal light reflex, which is here, 
with the very bright um, kind of slit lamp light bulb reflex, which we all, usually we were ignoring. But in this case, you want to superimpose those two reflexes so that they are going to be together. So you kind of superimpose them together. And then you uh, move the joystick forward just a little bit so you can um, look at um, the posterior corneal surface. And if you're on high mag, you can actually see some of the uh, uh, kind of subtle um, things that you can see around the endothelium. Uh, another technique is sclerotic scatter. Um, so what you do here is you have a very, very intense, um, high kind of high intensity beam right on the limbus. And what happens is that the light from the sclera actually scatters and reflects kind of all over the cornea. And, and it can actually highlight um, subtle corneal, superficial corneal abnormalities. So in this case, um, this picture is showing um, kind of a light corneal scar that's highlighted by sclerotic scatter. So the light isn't on the scar, but it's kind of lit up um, with uh, light coming from the sclera. Um, one technique that I use um, sometimes is retroillumination. So this is where you have the light beam kind of shining directly into the pupil. Light uh, actually bounces off the retina and it shines back. Um, you can see abnormalities not of the cornea, not only of the cornea and lens, but it's really good at picking up um, iris uh, defects. So in this case, we're seeing diffuse kind of iris transillumination defects. This is a good technique to um, finding out whether or not you have a patent PI, peripheral iridotomy. Um, sometimes you can see a uh, iridotomy on slit lamp exam, but you're not able to tell if it's actually open or not. So retroillumination is a nice way because you'll see a bright red um, reflex coming back. And stop me anytime any, if anyone ever has any questions on anything. Um, so corneal staining. So most um, common stain that's used is fluorescein. You can find it in a solution or in strips. Um, and this stains um, exposed basement membrane. Um, so you can um, highlight corneal epithelial defects. Um, you can also highlight um, punctate epithelial erosions, which we see in dry eye, which is shown here. Um, some other stains are rose bengal and glistening green. So rose bengal stain, uh, stains devitalize cells. Um, it also um, can highlight um, kind of staining patterns that are similar to what you can see with fluorescein and dry eye, but probably stains even more. Um, you can highlight, it can highlight uh, devitalized cells even on the conjunctiva a bit better. Um, however, rose bengal stings a lot, even with topical anesthetics. So glistening green is a nice alternative um, which also stains devital devitalized cells, but it's less irritating than rose bengal. And this is a very, very intense dark green. Um, so in this case, you can see um, some dryness on the bulbar conjunctiva. Uh, let's see, what other exam tips to know about when you're starting off? Um, you wanna remove soft contact lenses prior to placing fluorescein, because fluorescein will stain contacts forever. Um, doesn't damage it, but it's just gonna be bright orange forever. Um, so you want to make sure you take those out prior. Um, you want to keep track of your tetracaine and your um, bottles of fluorescein because um, you worry about tetracaine abuse, especially in patients with corneal ulcers or corneal abrasions because they'll notice as soon as you put in those drops, everything feels a lot better. So um, they may not, they're not going to know that it's bad to keep putting in topical anesthetic. Uh, so keep track of that. Um, so I always keep mine in my pocket and not really have it out on the counter. Um, anyone with a um, abrasion that's not easily explainable or anyone with red eyes, you want to flip and evert um, upper lids to look for foreign bodies. Um, sometimes you're surprised by what you find under there. Um, so make sure you always do that. Um, all right, next, common corneal conjunctival issues. So I'm going to go over all these issues here. These are kind of bread and butter. Um, the acute category are things you're going to see on call um, chronically. Um, you might see some of these on call, but I typically will see a lot of these in my clinic. Um, so here are kind of the three classic um, uh, uh, categories of conjunctivitis, bacterial, viral, and allergic. Oftentimes the history will actually point you um, to one of these categories. So with bacterial conjunctivitis, the classic thing is there'll be a very purulent discharge as seen here. Um, with viral conjunctivitis, um, by history, there's usually um, upper respiratory symptoms, um, maybe some sick contacts. 
Um, they'll have um, some tearing, some discharge, that'll start in one eye, you have some redness, um, and then it goes to the other eye within a couple of days. Um, with allergic conjunctivitis, it's class, it's typically in both eyes um, pretty um, symmetrically, and itching is going to be the big hallmark with allergic conjunctivitis. Um, so on exam, uh, looking at the palpebral conjunctiva, we can look at um, kind of conjunctival reactions. So follicles are typically seen in viral conjunctivitis, and a follicle is a cluster of lymphocytes, um, and there are vessels, but they tend to be kind of more in the periphery of the follicle, um, less so often right in the center. Um, and uh, let's see what else. Uh, papi oh, papillae, in contrast, are uh, vascular changes within the palpebral conjunctiva. Uh, so with uh, papillae, you actually have a um, dilated vessel that kind of sprouts uh, some spoke-like capillaries um, all around, um, and that, that, that whole thing is surrounded by edema. So with papillae, um, it's very vascular. That's kind of the hallmark of papillae. So that's one way to kind of tell the difference. Sometimes you have a mix. Um, actually, oftentimes you have a mix of both papillae and follicles. So you may not have, you know, such a classic appearance. Um, but those are kind of the ways you distinguish papillae and follicles. Papillae are uh, most classically seen in allergic conjunctivitis. Um, but uh, you can also see it with bacterial conjunctivitis as well. Um, giant papillary conjunctivitis is seen here. So you have these really large bumps on the uh, conjunctiva, especially when you flip over the upper lid. And this is seen, um, classically seen as a reaction to contact lenses. Uh, next, episcleritis. So this is a benign transient inflammation of the episclera, which is right underneath the conjunctiva. Um, so by history, patients will complain of redness, really minimal or no pain. Um, typically, it's going to be kind of a sectoral pattern like here. Um, on exam, um, classically, this redness will blanch after uh, placement of phenylephrine. So about five minutes later, this will all kind of blanch out to be very, very light in color or even white. Um, typically, I don't work up episcleritis unless it's recurrent. Um, there are some, a few systemic associations. It's associated with herpes zoster. Um, collagen vascular disease, gout and syphilis. So if it is recurrent, um, here's some of the lab work um, that can be checked. Uh, typically this is self-limited. It actually can get better on its own without any treatment. Um, um, you can consider high dose um, uh, oral NSAIDs or topical NSAIDs or steroids to really speed up the recovery. Um, next is scleritis, which is typically very tender, very painful, very red. Um, the, there's no blanching with any phenylephrine with um, uh, scleritis. Uh, there are three types. There's non-necrotizing, which is probably the most common type. There is a type that's painless, that's necrotizing without inflammation or terms scleromalacia perforans, as well as a necrotizing type with inflammation. Um, and scleritis has a very uh, significant association with systemic disease. Um, so here are some of these systemic associations, um, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, ankylosing spondylitis, uh, psoriasis, Crohn's, um, vasculitis, vasculitides, um, and always syphilis and TB. Um, so with scleritis, as opposed to episcleritis, you always want to work up scleritis. Um, and you can use some of history and review of, system, review of systems to guide testing, um, kind of as shown here. Um, Sometimes lab work will be negative, um, and if that's the case, you want to consider repeat testing in the year. Um, the other thing about scleritis is that um, it's typically going to be there until um, it's treated, so it's not going to get better on its own. Um, so non-necrotizing scleritis, this is kind of the most common one um, that we'll see. It is also the least severe version of scleritis. Um, classically, a very violaceous hue, a very bright uh, red, um, there's a 50% association with systemic disease. 50% of the cases are bilateral. Um, and like I said, it, this, this is going to be remaining there until treatment is given, um, which I'll go over later on. Um, next type of scleritis is scler scleromalacia perforans, or necrotizing scleritis without inflammation. Um, this is a painless white quiet eye with thin sclera. Uh, typically, you'll see it in elderly patients, very commonly bilateral. 50% uh, of these cases are from um, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, so you can see these thinned areas of sclera with some of the uveal tissue kind of showing through. Um, scleral rupture is thankfully rare, 
um, and it rarely needs surgical repair. Um, but again, um, medical treatment is warranted. Uh, necrotizing scleritis with inflammation. So this is the last uh, kind of subtype of scleritis. Um, this is very painful, bilateral in most cases. And this is the most destructive form of scleritis. There's vision loss in 40% of cases, high association with systemic vasculitis, such as uh, Wegener's or its new name, granulomatosis with polyangiitis. And there's actually a really high mortality rate, 20% uh, at five years. So um, you can see that there is kind of very severe thinning um, of the sclera. This can lead to scleral perforation. Um, so this is uh, one that you will want to basically work with the rheumatologist on for treatment. Um, so I guess I didn't really go into treatment, but um, um, it's going to be systemic um, immunosuppression for scleritis. So um, oral steroids, um, maybe working with uh, rheumatology to work with other non-steroidal um, systemic treatments. Uh, next, contact lens abuse, very common. Um, so typically by history, patients will have greater than 12 hours a day of wear, commonly sleeping in their lenses, poor um, contact lens hygiene. Um, and this is gonna be bilateral in most cases. Um, there's a lot of redness of the conjunctiva here. Um, you'll see a vascular panis, which is a sign of kind of chronic, um, long, um, many, many, many hours compounded of uh, contact lens use. Um, you'll see some punctate staining on the cornea, and you can see these fine epithelial or subepithelial opacities here. So treatment is um, artificial tears, uh, stopping the contact lenses until symptoms resolve. Um, you can also consider a mild uh, topical steroid drop, uh, such as FML or Lodomax. Uh, next, corneal ulcer. Um, the most frequent risk factor is, again, contact lenses. Um, but there are other so several other uh, kind of risk factors as well, previous eye surgery, trauma, uh, being a healthcare worker in a nursing home, and exposed to a lot of um, bacteria. Um, concurrent ocular surface disease, meaning um, very, very severe dry eye can also predispose one to ulcers if one has uh, systemic immunosuppression. Um, and by history, you wanna get from the patient uh, their degree of pain, how long they've been experiencing symptoms, any other eye drops that they've used, or maybe you know, did they seek care at the primary care doctor or an optometrist um, for uh, treatment with any other drops. Um, bacterial etiology is the most common um, etiology. It's typically a very quick onset, uh, but you can also get viral, um, corneal ulcers, fungal, and parasitic. Um, so here's kind of a whole range of different what the uh, corneal ulcers can look like. Um, so on exam, um, you want to carefully look at the ulcer and be able to describe it. So location, is it peripheral? Is it superior? Is it inferior? Kind of where is it at? What's the shape? Is it round? Is it linear? Um, is it stellate? Is it fluffy? Um, the size of it, so you can kind of measure that with the slit lamp. Um, the depth, is it a superficial corneal ulcer? Is it uh, kind of endothelial? Is it panstromal? And you can tell with the slit lamp exactly how deep it goes. Um, and kind of the density and consistency is a very like opaque, very dense ulcer. Is it kind of light? Can you still kind of see through it? Um, consistency, um, is it um, kind of fluffy, have feathery edges? Um, also look and see if there's an associated inflammatory response, meaning are there um, keratic precipitates? Is there a lot of haziness around the actual borders um, of the cornea ulcer, kind of in the stroma, you can sometimes see a lot of um, haziness. Um, so kind of note all that, put that all um, in the exam. Um, so when do you want to culture? You don't have to culture all cornea ulcers, um, but you do definitely want to consider it in some of these instances. So you want to culture if it's large, and large, you know, probably anything over two millimeters I might consider large. Um, is it vision threatening? Um, meaning is it close to the visual axis? So, so this one could be a vision threatening one. So maybe this is more into culture, um, even if it's a small one. Um, is there an associated hypopian? I definitely want to culture that. And anyone who's had previous eye surgery, especially a cornea transplant, um, you want to culture. So this is an example of a large, obvious large uh, cornea ulcer. Maybe there's a hypopian kind of starting there. So this is definitely one to culture. And this is also one culture. 
Um, so how do you culture? So in the books, uh, the Kimura spatula, which is shown here, is the uh, classic way of uh, culturing, um, which we don't really use too often. But if you do happen to find one, you could you'd have to sterilize it and use it to scrape into the infiltrate and um, kind of culture it over different culture plates. Um, you can also use a calcium alginate swab, which is almost like a mini Q-tip to kind of do the same thing. Um, and um, you can send the cultures for her gram stain um, classically. And again, I'm going to go into the new, newer method that we've been using to culture. But classically, you do culture on different plates. So there's blood agar for aerobic bacteria, chocolate agar for Neisseria and Haemophilus, uh, sabards agar for fung uh, fungus, uh, thioglycolate broth for anaerobic bacteria. Um, pages media is something that you do have to um, still get for if you want to culture acanthamoeba, acanthamoeba. So there's a separate swab that you get for that. Um, and there's also a separate uh, media for viral cultures. It kind of comes in a pink um, test tube looking thing where it comes with a, its own swab uh, for culturing herpes viruses. Um, however, um, we have something called the e-swab, which is really nice because it really simplifies um, culturing so you don't have to go around finding all these different plates. So uh, the e-swab looks like this. It's a little bit of a q-tip look um, and it's got, so it's a nylon tips uh, swab and it's got um, kind of these fine little fibers within the swab that allows for improved sample collection um, by increased capillary action and uh, liquid uptake. And so it, the e-swab comes with this um, container here um, which is a modified Amy's medium, which is then aliquoted in the lab for culture. Um, it, it has found, been found to be non-inferior to traditional uh, collection methods with regards to culture positivity rate. Um, so you can run, so off of one swab, you can run the aerobic cultures, anaerobic cultures, and fungal cultures. So again, don't have to go hunting around for different plates. Um, but like I said, if you want to get acanthamoeba or fungus, or sorry, acanthamoeba or viral cultures, you do have to get um, separate media for those. Um, stop me if there's any questions on anything. Um, okay, so you've got an ulcer, you've cultured it, how do you wanna treat it? So it depends. Um, it's gonna depend on how bad it is. So um, generally, you, could, you might consider starting off with fourth generation uh, fluoroquinolone, such as um, Vigamox four times a day or up to every hour. Um, but it is going to depend on how bad it is. If it's a pretty large ulcer, I would go to fortified antibiotics. So um, whenever we mention fortified antibiotics for me, that usually means Vank and Tobra. Um, you can order them right in Epic. Um, they are compounded either at Moran or also the inpatient pharmacy if you have someone over the main hospital. Um, these are the concentrations here. Vancomycin is 25 uh, milligrams per ml. Tobramycin is 15 milligrams per ml. Um, and having that placed in Q1 to two hours. Um, you might consider also adding a cycloplegic agent such as cyclogel, homatropine, or atropine um, to kind of prevent iris spasm. And it, it, I, I kind of describe to patients, it's gonna take the edge off of some of the pain, definitely not gonna significantly get rid of pain, but it, it helps a little bit. Um, I like it because if there's a big inflammatory response, um, like if there's a lot of cells in the EC or hypopion, you're gonna decrease um, the chance of getting CDKI if you add a cycloplegic agent in. Um, if you have a pet patient who's um, homeless, maybe some questionable compliance issues, um, you wanna consider admitting as an inpatient for treatment. Um, okay, so moving off of that kind of more bacteria or uh, ulcers, we're gonna to move to herpes. So herpes simplex keratitis, um, something that is seen very commonly um, patient symptoms are going to be kind of vague. Um, it's, they're not going to really point to any specific one thing. Um, they're going to complain of redness and blurry vision. Um, and they could either have mild irritation or they could have severe pain. So it kind of has, runs the whole gamut. Um, they will have diminished corneal sensation on exam. Um, so you want to check that prior to anesthetic, uh, placing a topical anesthetic. And what I do is I take um, kind of one of those um, sterile Q-tips and kind of pinch off the edge of it so that it kind of strands off into a very fine fiber and use that little fine strand um, to kind of touch the corneal surface on each eye and ask the patient, you know, do you feel it more in one eye versus the other or is it pretty equal? 
And usually people will tell you like if they have their diminished sensation that they'll feel it less in one eye. Um, let's see, types of herpes simplex keratitis. Um, there's epithelial and you'll see a dendrite here and kind of a branching lesion um, that's superficial that stains. And you'll see uh, kind of terminal end bulbs at the end of each little branch. So it kind of have a little bulb at the end. Um, that's classic for herpes simplex keratitis. Uh, stromal um, keratitis is gonna be the most common cause of um, herpes simplex keratitis. And it's actually the most common cause of infectious corneal blindness in the US. Um, a subtype of that is discoform, um, which yeah, it's kind of a very blurry picture, but discoform type is um, stromal edema that's in a round distribution that's associated with uh, keratic precipitate. So it's kind of more posterior in the cornea. Um, another term that's thrown around is endotheliitis. So it's kind of more at the endothelium or focused on the endothelium with discoform keratitis. Um, so treatment of epithelial disease. Um, cases will actually can resolve spontaneously, but I usually will treat patients with um, HSV keratitis. Um, treatment will dramatically shorten the uh, disease course. Um, kind of in the past, the only antiviral, topical antiviral that was, that was available was uh, trifluoridine, which is viroptic. However, I rarely um, prescribe this nowadays because it's pretty toxic to the ocular surface. Um, if I'm going to prescribe something topical, it's going to be Zergan, which is topical gang cycle here five times a day. Downside of Zergan is it's sometimes very expensive, not covered by insurance. Um, but that's okay because we can go with something oral, um, such as acyclovir. Um, the classic dosage is 400 milligrams five times a day. You could do kind of a variation of that 800 milligrams twice a day just to make it easier for patients. Um, and you can also do Valtrex. Um, we do, uh, classically do not want to give any topical steroid with um, dendritic keratitis because um, that could actually worsen it. Um, some people will actually debride, you can actually debride off a dendrite with like a Q-tip at the surface. So that's something that could be considered. I don't typically do that. I might consider it if I have someone who's not responding very well to treatment, to a traditional treatment. Um, a few decades ago, there was the uh, herpes eye disease study or head study, which is kind of one of those big landmark um, trials. Um, and the purpose of this was to evaluate the efficacy of different treatments on HSV keratitis. So they had three arms, um, one arm looking at HSV stromal keratitis, and they were looking at whether topical steroids along with viroptic, topical viroptic was helpful. Uh, second arm was also, again, looking at stromal keratitis, seeing if oral acyclovir was helpful in patients already on topical steroids and um, topical uh, viroptic. Uh, last arm was looking at HSV iridocyclitis, again, looking at steroids and viroptic and seeing whether or not the addition of oral acyclovir was helpful. Um, so here are the results. So with the first arm, they did find that topical steroids given with trifluoridine reduced the progression of uh, and shorten the duration of stromal keratitis. So I'll give steroids for stromal keratitis. Um, they didn't see an additional benefit of um, adding oral antivirals in patients already on topical steroids and um, uh, topical antiviral. Um, however, however, what I usually do um, is I'll e either, with if I've, if I've got stromal keratitis, I usually do an, like oral antiviral such as acyclovir and or um, Valtrex in addition to steroids. Um, if I'm giving someone Zergan, say hey, I may or may not give the oral, but I usually do. Uh, the trend, there's a, there was a trend to um, the benefit of oral acyclovir in patients with HSV um, iridocyclitis who are already on topical steroids and topical antiviral. Um, however, the weakness of the study was they didn't have a ton of patients with HSV iridocyclitis. Um, I think most, patients, most clinicians will actually will give oral acyclovir with HSV iridocyclitis. Um, let's see, with HSV disease, um, you know, I, I talked about the doses for acyclovir in the treatment, um, which was the 400 milligrams five times a day. Um, but if someone is taking prophylactic dose, it's going to be lower than the treatment dose. So it's going to be acyclovir 400 milligrams twice a day. 
Um, here's some of the alternatives. You can do Valtrex once a day or um, Famvir, which I don't use quite as often. Um, there's a dosage there. Um, HSV late complications um, are many. Um, number one is going to be a neurotrophic cornea, meaning a cornea that doesn't have proper sensation. That's going to lead to dryness. Um, it can also lead to non-healing epithelial defects. Um, you can get corneal scarring, neovascularization, recurrent inflammation, um, and corneal thinning. Um, switching gears to a related um, condition, herpes zoster. Um, so this is a reactivation of latent uh, varicell zoster, um, and there is um, involvement of the ophthalmic division of um, cranial nerve 5, so the V1 distribution. Uh, classically, you have Hutchinson's sign, which is the rash going all the way down to the tip of the nose. And the involvement of the tip of the nose means that the nasal ciliary nerve is involved. The nasal ciliary nerve innervates the conjunctival cornea, sclera iris, choroid, and skin of both eyelids and is a strong predictor of ocular inflammation. Um, zoster manifestations are gonna be more common in elderly, but you know nowadays we're seeing this in plenty of younger patients. So it's not just something that we'll see in older patients. Uh, a very wide range of ocular involvement and severity. It could be an anterior segment, it could be a posterior segment, it can be both. It can be acute, chronic, or relapsing. Um, you can get kind of a dendrite appearance just like you can with simplex, except the dendrites um, look a bit different. So they have, a, um, I term a stuck on appearance. So with simplex dendrites, they're kind of excavated, like it's almost like there's a divot in the dendrite. With a pseudodendrite, it looks more stuck on. So with these 2D pictures, you can't tell that, but um, kind of a, you'll, you'll see it kind of looks almost like a blob on the cornea, like it's a little bit elevated um, in zoster. Um, and the dendrites are not quite as well formed. You don't have terminal end bulbs, um, like there's no nice kind of ending to the dendrite. It's kind of a little bit branchy, but not quite as, um, uh, I guess, pretty that you'll see with a uh, simplex uh, keratitis. Um, can lead to stromal keratitis. And like um, simplex, you're gonna have decreased corneal sensation. Um, so classically, if the symptoms started more, kind of more recently, start the cycle of your 800 milligrams five times a day for 10 days. Um, I, I will start this nowadays, even if symptoms started kind of you know, more maybe you know, earlier than 72 hours prior. Um, and there may be a role for reduced dose long term, which is kind of a uh, kind of the uh, topic of a big multi center study, the ZEDS trial, Zoster Eye Disease Study, that's looking at whether. Um, kind of low-dose Valtrex for one year after um, kind of acute um, symptoms can reduce the um, incidence of recurrent disease. Um, there may be a role of topical antivirals as well. Um, definitely want to use topical steroids, um, and you often need a very slow taper. And I've got uh, many patients who need to be on chronic topical steroids just to prevent any... Um, hey, Dr. Lin. <clears throat> Let's see, late complications of um, simplex um, post herpetic neuralgia, um, where there's continued severe pain after, even after uh, the inflammation in the eye is gone. Um, I'll typically refer these patients off to their primary care doctor or neurologist for something like epipentin or tricyclic antidepressants or lyrica. Um, as far as eye complications, uh, long term complications, it's the same as HSV. So, this is the same list that I had before neurotrophic cornea, scarring, new vascularization, recurrent inflammation, corneal thinning. So, it can be pretty devastating. This is an example of someone with scarring, new vascularization, corneal thinning in spots. This looks like maybe a desmetaceal, so, it can cause very severe complications. Uh, next, so again, this is a potpourri of lots of topics. Um, so next we're going to switch gears to corneal trauma. Um, so corneal abrasion, something you'll see very commonly, you put in the fluorescene um, in a patient who has a lot of pain and you see a big heavy defect. Um, so treatment of it, typically fluoroquinolone four times a day is fine. Um, you can also consider a cycloplegic agent just again for taking the edge off the pain. Um, you can consider a bandage contact lens or a pressure patch. Um, if there's any concern for infection or if the abrasion happened in the setting of someone who's a contact lens wearer, I worry about infection, so I may not place 
bandage contact lens in those cases. Um, you could consider even a pressure patch um, on the eye to help the eye heal. Um, patient would have to kind of take it off once a day, put an ointment and you, you know, either you have to see the patient to put the patch on or they need a very good kind of um, person who lives with them or can take care of them to um, put the pressure patch on um, in a correct fashion. Uh, you want to clo uh, closely follow these patients to um, make sure they don't get infection. Um, if there's not really a clear reason why there's an abrasion, such as you know, there wasn't really any trauma or any known foreign body that flew in, um, kind of look at the eye examined for exposure. So meaning, you know, make sure the eye, there's no lag ophthalmos, make sure the eye can actually close. Um, you can also avert, evert the upper lid to look for foreign bodies that could have caused that abrasion. Um, so corneal foreign bodies um, are very common, and here's what they always look like. Um, metal is the most common. Um, they pretty much will get a rust ring that will start to set in pretty frequently. Um, so they're typically pretty superficial. You can re uh, remove it with a 27 to 30 gauge needle. Um, you could consider um, a burr to kind of burr out the rust ring, or you could, um, I like using a needle actually for removing the rust ring, but you know, both ways are fine. Um, afterwards, there's like a little crater um, in the cornea, so you want to treat it like a corneal abrasion. Um, however, sometimes you, you can see like a surrounding white, looks like a white infiltrate that's usually sterile. Um, so in those cases, I'll add a little bit of a steroid, like a combination antibiotic steroid such as mac, uh, Maxitrol. If it's really deep, you don't want to pursue it. Um, kind of send them to you know, me or one of the other cornea specialists to have a look. Um, and you always want to counsel a patient on eye protection so they don't get this again. Um, this patient's lucky it's not in the visual axis, but if you imagine if this were moved a few millimeters over, this would be very visually significant. Um, see, other traumas, uh, corneal laceration. So you want to determine if it's a partial or full thickness laceration. Um, so do the Seidel test, see if you have um, evidence of leakage. Um, another test you can do um, is to kind of check the anterior chamber depth and kind of comparing it with the other eye. So if you've got like a full chamber, probably a full thickness uh, penetration. Um, if you've got a shallow chamber, kind of compare with the other eye. Um, and if it looks equally shallow, you're probably okay. But if the other eye looks a lot deeper, then again, you kind of get concerned about a um, full thickness perforation. Obviously, if there's peaking of the pupil, iris prolapse, you've got a full thickness uh, perforation. Um, if it's partial thickness, um, and if you see any foreign material there, um, you can try and irrigate it out or remove it with uh, Julius forceps at the slit lamp. But if it's something more complicated than what you can do at the slit lamp, um, you want to take them to the OR. Um, definitely want to take them to the OR if it's a full thickness um, maceration. So you want to place a shield on the eye prior, um, just so no one else, or you know, no one else or the patient, you know, will be able to bump their eye. Um, you might consider um, IV antibiotics and making them MPO in preparation for surgery. Okay, so we've gone through some acute eye diseases. We're going to go into some common chronic ones. Um, blepharitis, super common. I feel like the vast majority of patients have some um, form of blepharitis. Um, anterior blepharitis is seen here so that you'll see colorets around the eyelashes. Um, for these cases, um, lid scrubs are very effective. Um, more commonly, a lot more commonly than anterior is um, posterior blepharitis, where you'll see plugged up oil uh, meibomian glands or meibomian gland inspissation, um, which we see here. Um, warm compresses are going to be very effective for posterior blepharitis. Um, other treatments, artificial tears, you can also consider oral fish oil, um, oral doxycycline or minocycline. Um, we kind of use it for, not for its antibiotic properties, but it's actually got the positive side effect of opening up plugged up meibomian glands. So um, low dose doxy or minocycline can be helpful. I use 50 milligrams POBID as my standard dosage. Um, you can also consider like an antibiotic ointment such as erythromycin ointment to the lashes at bedtime. Um, related to buffaritis is dry eyes. Um, so symptoms uh, typically can include a whole range of symptoms, including tearing or dryness, redness, foreign body sensation, fluctuating vision during the day, um, having symptoms worse later in the day, um, worse um, uh, symptoms with their contact lenses. Um, 
And there's usually a combination of both evaporative um, etiologies along with uh, diminished tear secretions. So the evaporative etiology is going to be a lot more common. So you'll often see concurrent blepharitis, such as meibomian gland plugging. And again, when the meibomian glands are plugged, you don't have a proper lipid layer for the tear film. Tears are going to evaporate more rapidly. Um, you could also have diminished um, tear secretion or kind of diminished aqueous layer of the tear film. Um, you'll see this with autoimmune diseases, um, sarcoid and collagen vascular disease. And you typically see inflammation um, associated with dry eyes, meaning some redness, um, inflammation of the conjunctiva. Uh, on exam, you'll see interpalpebral staining. So this is some rose bengal staining uh, that you'll see in the interpalpebral space. Um, you'll see a low tear film. You can see mucus in the tear film. So mucus in the tear film represents dried up tears. Um, so that's a sign of dry eye. Um, and there's also a low tear breakup time. So the way you measure pure tear breakup time is I put a fluorescein drop in each eye. I get the light onto the cobalt blue and I'll ask the patient to kind of close their eyes and then open their eyes and stare. And you can start counting um, seconds off. And once you start seeing these um, the dark patches, that's actually an evaporated or broken up tear film. Um, so you stop counting whenever you see one of those um, kind of patches of black. And if that number that you get when you stop counting is less than 10 seconds, that's a low tear breakup time. Um, so again, kind of pointing to an evaporative etiology to their dry eye. Um, Shermer's, I don't do Shermer's testing um, really at all. Um, I might do it if someone is really asking me to or if it's for research purposes, but it's not a great um, uh, marker to dry eye. I, I feel like there's a lot of all these other um, things that you can do with the slit lamp are gonna be um, you know, pretty in indicative of uh, dry eye, but uh, classically there'll be a low Schirmer's test. So the Schirmer's test is where you put um, kind of uh, little uh, strips of filter paper hanging off the eyelids and you measure um, how how much of the uh, filter paper gets soaked with their, the patient's own tears over a five minute period. So five minutes pass with anesthetic in their eyes and they're soaking less than 10 millimeters on the filter paper, then that is a abnormal test. Um, treatment, there's tons of treatments. Um, so I kind of start usually with the non-prescription um, and non, I guess, invasive, um, treatments first. So something as simple as telling patients to take frequent breaks when reading or on the computer. So I just tell them, hey, every 20 minutes or so, just close your eyes real tight for like 20 seconds. That can help re-moisturize everything. A humidifier is really helpful. Artificial tears, of course. Um, bottled artificial tears, I tell people not to use them more than four times a day because the preservative can actually start to cause toxicity. Um, so switching a preservative free if they're using drops more than four times a day is something that I recommend. Um, gel or ointment at night. Um, this is something I'll recommend if someone is waking up with dry eye symptoms. That kind of tells me that their eyes are maybe not closed all the way while they're sleeping. It's a nighttime like ophthalmos. So uh, for those patients, I'll tell them to put in something thicker at night. Um, you know, if they're doing all of the above, and they're still having dry eye, um, then you can go prescription route. Um, there's now three prescription drop um, uh, drops available on the market now, Restasis, Zydra, and now Sequa. Um, for all of these, they do take a little bit of time to work. Restasis takes the longest time, three to four months. Zydra and Sequa, maybe about a month um, to start working, and they're all twice a day drops. Um, taking oral fish oil or even having olive oil in your diet can be helpful for dry eye. Um, moisture chamber goggles at bedtime can be helpful, again, if they're having a lot of um, AM symptoms. Um, and then punctal plugs and cautery, and lots of other treatments for dry eye, even beyond this list, um, which will be the topic of a future lecture. Um, so lastly, talking about Fuchs dystrophy. So Fuchs dystrophy, very common. It's an autosomal dominant corneal dystrophy. Um, you actually don't see signs of it until um, the patient is usually in their 40s or 50s, even though it's an inherited condition. And what Fuchs dystrophy is, is a progressive loss of endothelial cells um, that leads to corneal edema. So again, Endothelial cells are in a monolayer kind of all along here. Um, and in this case, you see there's very few. You don't have like a whole bunch in a row like I had in that kind of one of the first slides. There's just only a few endothelial cells. 
Um, and you also see these bumps in decimase membrane here. So these are excrescences of decimase membrane. And you'll see this clinically as mutata. Um, so patients will typically be completely asymptomatic um, if you're catching them early on exam. So if I see that, I tell them, hey, you've got this condition called Fuchs dystrophy. You're not having any symptoms from it. You know, we'll watch it. You may need treatment later on. Um, once patients start getting symptoms, they'll start off with having actually morning blurry vision, like right after they, that wake, they wake up, that improves later in the day. And the reason why that happens is during the night, um, you know, your eyes are closed and there's more fluid kind of around the cornea. And because there's not a great endothelial pump here, the cornea starts to get more edematous. And so when they first open their eyes, um, they're looking through a little bit more of an edematous cornea and they can notice um, some uh, blurred vision. During the course of the day, or maybe an hour or two later, depending on how severe the disease is, they'll notice that their vision's improving because they're literally, the cornea is drying out just from their eyelids being open. Um, so that's the mechanism of the AM blur that improves later. Um, so on slit lamp, you'll see um, gute or gutata, um, these little dots. So it kind of looks like, um, I'll describe it more like a, of an orange peel look to the endothelium. Um, so again, this represents the excrescences of decimase membrane. And to see guttata, you have to have a, kind of the highest intensity light beam. If you just have it on the low intensity beam, you're gonna miss like 75% of guttata. So have it on the high beam, um, focus on the endothelium with a slip beam and you'll be able to see them more easily. Um, and it takes time to, you know, when you're first starting out, in terms first year residents, it's gonna be really hard to see your first even 50 cases of Fuchs dystrophy, but you know, if you keep looking for it, you'll start to see it. Um, in more severe cases, you'll see corneal edema, um, and that can even lead to bullae, which are kind of bl um, blisters on kind of underneath the corneal epithelium. Um, with the edema of the cornea, you'll get a thicker um, uh, corneal thickness, which is measured with chemistry. So you might have a cornea that's over 600 microns. Um, I don't do pachymetry typically in Fuchs dystrophy um, because again, I, I kind of base my exam on the slit lamp. And so whether or not a patient has a 550 uh, thick cornea or a 650 thick cornea, it doesn't really matter. It kind of, what, what matters to me is what the patient's seeing, what their vision is and what I'm seeing on exam as far as what I'm gonna do next as far as treatment. Um, and same with uh, specular microscopy. So if you do a specular microscopy on patient with Fuchs, um, what this does is it measures the uh, endothelial cells. So it counts endothelial cells within a small um, area of the uh, endothelium. And if it's lower, again, it's gonna be indicative of Fuchs dystrophy. But again, I'm, this is not something I'm doing on all my patients, um, but um, it's useful for research um, doing specular counts. Um, so treatment. So if they're completely asymptomatic, there's really nothing to do except just tell the patient about it, tell them they should come in once a year for exams. Um, if they're having blurred vision in the morning, you can tell patients to put in hypertonic saline or Muro 128, and you want to make sure they get the 5% concentration, not the, I think 2.5 is the other one you can get. I never ever recommend 2.5. It's always 5%. Um, and you can get it in drop or ointment form. I, I typically do drops just because it's um, easier to put in and it's more useful in the morning. So tell patients, use the Miro in the morning when you wake up, that's gonna um, kind of try and that hypertonic saline will kind of draw out some of the excess fluid or edema in the cornea and try to decrease the cornea edema faster. Um, so in mild cases of Fuchs, this will actually work really well. Um, if it's more severe, it's not gonna do too much. Um, so. It's a nice treatment because I tell people it's literally just concentrated saline. It is going to sting a little bit when it goes in because it's kind of a higher salt content, but you know, it's not really like a prescription. You can get it over the counter. Um, so it's a nice, a nice way to have people maybe help with their vision faster in the morning. Um, if someone has Fuchs dystrophy and they need cataract surgery, there are some things you want to know about um, making sure that during surgery you protect the endothelium as much as possible because they're going to be more prone to get corneal edema after surgery. Um, if the Fuchs dystrophy is more visually significant, um, then you want to consider endothelial keratoplasty. 
Okay, next, special cases in the burn unit. So, so I think this is my last topic. So we're talking about thermal and chemical burns, as well as Stevens-Johnson syndrome. Let's check the time here. Okay, eight minutes, we can do it. Um, thermal burns um, are from um, flame or blast inju injury, scalding liquids. Uh, the globe is usually not involved because you got a, an eyelid reflex um, or the eye, you know, your eyelids are going to close. Um, and also you get a Bell's reflex as well, but um, you can have extensive eyelid involvement with thermal burns. Chemical burns can be from any number of agents. Um, alkali agents can usually penetrate deeper than acids. The mechanism of that is that usually acids cause a coagulation necrosis, so it prevents further penetration of the acid further down deep into the tissue, whereas alkali agents cause a saponification of fatty acids, which cause cellular disruption and it allows the chemical to actually reach the deeper tissues. So that's why usually alkali agents are worse than acids. However, there are a few strong acids that can be really bad on the eye, but typically it's going to be alkali injuries. Um, so acutely on exam, when you're consulted in the ER or when they're up in the burn unit, hopefully they'll have already irrigated the patient. Um, so if not, irrigate, check the pH, make sure it's seven. Uh, do a complete eye exam um, if you can. Um, and look at the eyelids, look at the edema, look at lagophthalmos, look at lash loss. Um, very importantly, you want to check the Bell's reflex if there is lagophthalmos. So here's a patient who, you know, this is him looking straight ahead, very severe burns as you can see. Um, and then when you ask him to you know, close your eyes, you still see that there's globe there. So this is severe lagophthalmos, but there's a good Bell's reflex, so he's at least protecting his cornea. Um, look at the conjunctiva corneal fornices, looking at epi defects, foreign bodies, any sort of opacities. Um, with chemical burns, you want to note the level of limbal ischemia, noting how white the eye is. So that whiteness actually represents a loss of limbal stem cells, which is a actually poorer prognosis than this eye that's very red. An eye that's very red is actually good. That means there's good vasculature all around. Hopefully they can heal this large epi defect and need this little easy inflammation that's on the eye, whereas this eye with a very white appearance has loss of vasculature, so they're, they're going to not heal their cornea um, as well. Um, late complications on the cornea, persistent corneal epithelial defects, they can even lead to corneal thinning and perforation, um, neovascularization and limbal stem cell deficiency um, are common. Um, the conjunctiva, there's going to be scarring or symbolophron formation on the eyelids. There'll be progressive scarring, cicatricial ectropion, trachiasis, and mycophthalmos. Uh, so treatment, um, oral vitamin C and doxycycline. Um, doxycycline to kind of help with um, counteracting any sort of corneal thinning that may be going on because um, it's got an anti-inflammatory effect. Uh, to the eyelids, um, some erythromycin ointment is good. Um, topical steroids, if there's a corneal epithelial defect, um, uh, sorry, yeah, fluoroquinolone, or uh, consider a topical steroid in the first one to two weeks to reduce inflammation. Um, might consider a bandaged contact lens or amniotic membrane. Um, if there's allogophthalmos, you want to have a very aggressive lubrication like ointment Q1 hour, moisture chamber goggles. Consider eyelid repair, but oftentimes they don't want to go into repair things acutely because um, things are going to change. So often you need to wait a while before he, they can get their eyelids repaired. So you want to consider scleral lens as an inpatient, um, which, um, so scleral lens is a large diameter gas perm contact lens. And so this can be considered in anyone with exposure and non-healing corneal epithelial defects, um, even despite kind of frequent ointment and moisture chamber goggles. Um, the scleral lens has a much less infection risk compared to a soft bandage contact lens. We have to have a whole protocol on box, and we have scleral lenses which are hidden somewhere in the resident room. Hopefully seniors know where they are. Um, so um, consider this and let me know if you are considering putting this in the patient. Um, they can be really, really helpful. So um, definitely know that that's something that you can do if you are being consulted on the patient. Um, lastly, SJS um, and toxic uh, epidermal necrolysis syndrome. So this is a rare, potentially life-threatening hypersensitivity spectrum of conditions that's triggered by medications or infections. There's sloughing of the skin and mucous membranes. The only way to diagnose it definitive, definitively is by skin biopsy. Um, so that's typically done in the burn unit. 
Um, so SJS involves 10 to 30% of total body surface area, TENS involves greater than 30%. Um, and patients look like this. I mean, this is a patient with literally no skin. There's no epithelial um, layer to this patient's skin. That's why it's red. It's not just red because of blood coming from somewhere else. This is red because you're looking at dermis. Um, so very severe. Um, eyes are involved in the majority of cases. Um, there can be inflammation, pseudomembranes, epithelial defects, a lot of late complications listed here, severe tri eye, keratinization of the eyelid margins, scarring, symbolophron, corneal opacities, thinning, perforation, and neovascularization. So lots of really horrible complications are possible. Um, however, there is treatment. So um, with everyone with SJS tens with ocular involvement, do lubrication, optical steroids, um, and then consider um, surgery, urgent surgery with amniotic membrane transplantation, which covers kind of the whole ocular surface, bulbar and palpebral conjunctiva, cornea, and the eyelid margins. And um, there are indications for this in the next slide, but amniotic membrane contains growth factors and anti-inflammatory mediators to promote healing and reduce inflammation, and it prevents late complications. So it's kind of the only thing that's been found to really prevent those horrible complications I had mentioned in the last previous slide. Um, so this is a, um, a table that helps us determine when to do amniotic membrane transplantation. So anyone with severe or very severe disease, which is defined as staining of at least a third of a lid margin on at least one lid, any corneal epithelial defect more than punctate staining, um, staining of the conjunctiva of greater than one centimeter. So if there's any one of these, um, you want to do urgent amniotic membrane transplantation. Um, this is my last slide. So here are some pictures of what some of these complications look like. Um, so this is a picture of lid margin keratinization. So you can tell there's, there's not, I mean, this is not a picture of the patient's whole eye, but the patient's whole eye actually looks pretty good. There's not really too much in the way of symblephron formation, but this patient has really, really severe pain, light sensitivity constantly because of lid margin keratinization. And you really have to pull the lid down to see it um, because what, and this is the same patient, I think, with um, just looking at the slit lamp without pulling the lid down. You just might see a hint of it with an irregular lid margin, but you don't really see it unless you pull the eyelid out like this. Um, this is a young patient who, her disease was kind of mild to moderate, kind of, it was kind of borderline for needing amniotic membrane, but it was done. You can see a little suture of one of the sutures that was placed for the amniotic membrane, but um, her lid margin looks great. There's no keratinization. I mean, besides that little suture that's there, you can't even tell that anything really happened to this patient's eyes. So this is a great result. Um, here's a patient who had amniotic membrane transplant done a bit late, maybe more than two weeks after presentation. Um, and so that was a bit too late. Um, this young patient has had severe um, uh, inflammation, severe scarring. You might get a sense of some of the lid margin keratinization. So um, really important to do amniotic membrane transplant kind of sooner rather than later in SJS. And that is it. Um, any questions on anything thus far? Hey, Dr. Lin, um, since uh, sequel and restasis, you know, are both like the sporin, if someone doesn't respond to restasis, do you not try sequel or is it still reasonable to give sequel a try in this kind of patient? Um, that's a good question. I mean, you, I would say usually no, but I have had actually a, a couple patients that I've tried that CEQA on where restasis didn't work and they had a good response to CEQA. Um, so I, I wouldn't say it's a definite rule out if someone didn't respond to restasis. Um, you can still try it. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Well, um, let me know if you have any questions on anything else cornea related. Um, look forward to kind of seeing you all with this new year. And um, that's about it. I guess have a great Monday, everyone. Thanks, Dr. Lynn. Welcome. Thank you. Uh -huh. Bye.